This is the video lecture on preferred and treasury stock. Now in an earlier lecture, we talked about common stock. But in this video, we're going to talk about some other types of stock as well. Specifically, preferred and treasury stock. Now first of all, we'll talk about preferred stock. Now the way it works is that if a company sells only one type of stock, then by default, they sell common stock. But if they decide to go over and above that and sell an additional classification of stock, then they may also decide to sell preferred stock. So this would always be in addition to the common stock. Now some companies do this and some don't. In fact, it's really not that common. It's really not that popular. But, simply because there are companies out there that do sell preferred stock, we still need to know a little bit about it and at least need to know how to record it because you never know when you're going to run across a company that does sell it. Now, how do we get that name preferred stock? It has to do with dividends. Now, you'll recall from our lecture on common stock, sometimes businesses pay out a cash dividend. If they sell preferred stock, then the preferred stockholders would actually get the first preference on dividends. In other words, they would be paid first. So that's where we get that title. Now it sounds impressive, but the question sometimes arises, is preferred stock really preferred? Well think about this. Usually preferred stock has no voting rights. There's no preemptive right. The market value sometimes fluctuates a little bit, but you don't see any major increases in market value. And yes, you do have that first preference for dividends if they even pay dividends. There's still no guarantee that the dividends will actually be paid. So when you look at this and you think about all the rights that we got as a common stockholder, is preferred stock really preferred? It isn't really. You know, if you buy preferred stock, it's probably just going to be a minor investment. You're hoping to leave the money in the stock. It's not going to change value that much. But if you're really trying to make money, most people prefer to, to invest in common stock. So that's probably why selling preferred stock is not that popular among very many companies. But nevertheless, it is good to know, just in case, how to actually do the journal entry for preferred stock. So if you look at this example, say that a company issues 10 shares of $100 par value preferred stock, and they're going to sell this for $1,100 cash. The proper way to record this would be to debit cash for $1,100, that's the actual amount of cash received. Credit preferred stock. Notice only for a thousand because we only want to use the par value. So that extra one hundred dollars that was made that will go to paid in capital. So that's the appropriate way to record preferred stock. And what's interesting about this is really it's no different than the journal entries that we recorded in the previous lecture. All we changed is the word common to the word preferred. So it's literally that easy. You just change common to preferred. And like I said, you would only have to worry about this for those handful of companies that sell preferred stock. Now the next type of stock that we're going to talk about in this lecture is treasury stock. Treasury stock is a unique situation. This is a situation where the company buys back its own stock. So that's a little bit unusual. You are actually buying back your own shares of stock. When we do that, we call that treasury stock. Now why would we do that? There are actually different reasons why. For one, we might be doing this to prevent a takeover. Now, why, why would we have to do that? Well, think about this. For every share of stock that's out there, the person gets voting rights. And the more stock that they own, the more powerful their vote is. And if they want to control our company, 
the key percentage of ownership is 51%. If anybody can get 51% of our stock, then for all practical purposes, they control our company. So if we see someone out there purchasing large quantities of our stock, it might be a red flag that they're trying to take over our company. So to prevent that, we could buy back our own stock so that that way the person couldn't get enough. We also might do this as a stock bonus to our employees. We may simply buy back some of our own shares in order to award those as a bonus to our employees. We also may do this as part of a stock purchase plan. Many businesses allow their employees to contribute a certain amount of their paycheck towards stock purchases. And over time, the employees are entitled to shares. So in order to satisfy that plan, we may have to buy back some of our own stock in order to give that to those employees. And also to satisfy stock options. And we've never talked about stock options, but basically this is a situation when we give someone a right to purchase a certain number of shares at a certain price. And if we do that, and if they exercise that option, we might have to come up with the stock to give them. So if we have to do that, we would have to buy our own stock. So all of those are just different reasons why we might potentially have treasury stock. Now, first of all, we're going to do an example of buying the treasury stock, but then we're going to take a look at what happens when we sell it back. So in this example, we're going to buy 1,000 shares of our own stock. And to do this, we're going to pay $10,000 cash. So I'm going to debit treasury stock for $10,000 and credit cash for $10,000. Now what's odd is that out of all the stock journal entries that we've done up until this point, we've never debited stock before. We've always been crediting but see how this is an unusual situation. We're buying back our own stock. So that's why we have to debit that. And of course we credit cash to show that we've spent the money. And what this insinuates is that if I spent $10,000 to buy 1,000 shares of my own stock, it insinuates to me that the stock is probably selling for $10 a share. And that $10 is an important number that we're going to need to know for these next two journal entries. So after time has passed, we bought 1,000 shares. After some time has passed, we may decide to turn around and sell that stock back. So we're going to sell 500 shares back, and we're going to sell it back for $6,000. So if that's the case, I can debit cash for 6000 to show that I'm receiving that money. I'm going to credit treasury stock for 5000 Why for 5000 Well, remember, I said an important number was that $10. Whatever the original price is that I paid for that treasury stock, that's going to be like a par value. So the half of the stock, half of 1000 is 500 so half of this that I'm selling back, that was 5000 half of 10 Then I have a $1,000 discrepancy. That extra $1,000 that I made goes to paid-in capital. Now even more time has passed, and now I'm going to sell back the remaining 500 shares. This time I'm going to sell these shares back for $3,000 cash. Now evidently what has happened is evidently the market price of the stock has fallen. So this transaction is not going to work out quite as nice as the previous one. I will debit cash $3,000. That's the amount of cash received. I will credit treasury stock for $5,000. That's the other half of the treasury stock that I bought. But notice how it doesn't balance. It's out of balance by $2,000. So essentially, I have lost $2,000 on this sale. 
Now, some people would question that, and they would say, well, then why would I do this? Why would I sell this and take a loss? Well, think about it this way. If the market price is falling, maybe I should go ahead and sell it, because if I wait, I might lose even more money. So you always have to deal with these types of situations. So I've got a $2,000 loss. Now, what I would like to do is actually take that $2,000 out of paid in capital, but I can't do that. And to understand that, I want to back up for a second and look at that previous entry. On that last entry, when I sold those first 500 shares, I made $1,000 on paid in capital. Well, now I'm losing $2,000, but I don't have enough in my paid in capital to cover that. So I will debit paid in capital, but only for 1000 So where will I take out that extra 1000 I have no choice but to take it from my retained earnings. That is the accumulated profits from the past. So remember that. Remember, I can never take more out of paid in capital than what I already have in it. 